very happy to have this opportunity to get my good friend, Dick Richard Lyon, to come and visit. He's very busy, of course, and it was not easy to um, find a time when we could do this, but eventually we pursued it, and here he is. So I've known Dick, we can't figure out how long, but we know for sure that we met at ICASP in Paris, and I was there because I was running ICASP in New York, which was in 83, so we saw each other again there, and I, my first recollection of Dick was we were standing around a pool table, shooting pool, I'm sure he beat me, I have no recollection of who won, I'm not sure I was even paying attention because we were arguing ferociously about cochlear modeling and um, more in violent than in agreement than anything. But it was a fun experience. And I remember another incident where um, Carver Mead came to um, a meeting on, uh, I think it was IHCon, uh, some meeting in um, California. And I got to meet him, which was very enjoyable. And he was an advisor at Caltech of Richards. Now, just another couple minutes here, or a minute. Um, the thing that's especially important about Dick is his breadth. And this is a problem, because he does something amazing, and then he switches fields and then he does something amazing in that field, and then he switches fields, and then does something amazing again. And so you can't keep track of where he's been and what he's doing. And um, he knows, though. But it's pretty hard to keep, keep an eye on him because of this. So he was the first one to invent and make work an optical mouse, which we all use today. And he made um, one, if not, I think it was the first um, internet transceiver, an ethernet transceiver, right, or chip, something like that. Something and like he, that. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah, something like that. And he also worked on GPS systems before they were viable. And then he designed the Fovian camera, which, Fovian camera, which was the first color single chip camera with an inventive design. And so there's, and there's a really, on his web page, if you Google and look at his web page, there's a really nice 25 page discussion by the Museum of Computer Museum, which is just a few blocks away from Google, I think, right? And it's a nice long interview that goes into great detail. It's wonderful. And I read it and I, it, I recommend it. So we have a little gift for Dick. And um, you can open this later because we should get started. But thank you for coming. And <clears throat> is it like a box of chocolates? No. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, John. Thanks for inviting me. And for the others of you here who helped twist my arm to get me here. I've had a great day so far. I didn't know there were so many cool people and things at Illinois. And uh, yeah, it's been great fun. So, you know, I forgot, forgot to get one of my props out of the bag, which I'll get in a second here. I'll get it later. Um, my book. So the talk about Machine hearing is really um, kind of a romp through the book. This is a book I spent seven years on. It came out in uh, 2017. And as I'll show you, if you stick around for the last slide, you can access the uh, complete free version of it online if you uh, don't want to buy a copy off Amazon or something. Um, the concept in this book is that neuroscience is important if you want to make machines that hear. So we've seen this in vision. There's an awful lot of uh, visual neuroscience that went into designing machine vision systems. And if you look at the architectures of the deep neural networks that people use today for vision, there's an awful lot of uh, bio-inspired stuff in there, even though they, they may often try to sweep that under the rug if it's not what they're working on. Um, but 
it's the same way in sound, and we need to understand what happens when sound goes in our ears. So what I call uh, peripheral mechanics, that means what's going on in the cochlea, where sound waves get uh, converted to a form that can be turned into neural signals and sent to the brain, and then the various uh, things that go on in the brain stem and all the way up to the auditory cortex. We need to understand what's going on in there, and the thesis is that a lot of what's going on in there is to turn sound, this one-dimensional waveform versus time, to turn it into something that's more image-like, because the, the auditory cortex is a lot like visual cortex, and you need to project representations onto it that are sort of image-like. So I'll talk about how we go about that. <clears throat> in, in the book, I propose a uh, kind of this simple layered architecture for building machine hearing systems in which we, we have these, um, these two lower levels that I call more biomimetic, that is, they mimic the biology, the auditory periphery and the auditory image computation. And then we have the upper layers that more resemble what you find in the in the machine vision field where you put you put these images into networks and you you train them to extract features or to uh, extract answers for the domain of interest and the concept of meaning the concept of extracting meaning from sound is just that when you build this kind of a system what comes out the top is in some sense useful to you you've extracted information from sound and that information is meaningful in the sense that it helps you do some job. So whatever your system is, whether it's uh, speech recognition, music recommendation, or, or um, recognizing dogs barking or gunshots or whatever, if you can do that job, you've extracted meaning from the sound. So this, is, this architecture is sort of a, a way to think about building systems to do that. <clears throat> Hopefully not uh, too constraining. I don't mean every system has to exactly match these four layers, but it's, it's the way I think about it. And the, the lower layers of this, if you, can, if you can accept these as sort of a good front end, it's like, what does the ear send to the brain? If we get that layer right, <clears throat> then when you want to extract meaning from sound, you don't really have to worry about that anymore. You can innovate at the upper levels. But my specialty is more at the lower layers, so that's more of what I'm going to talk about. I'll, I'll say a little bit about the upper part, too. So to start with, uh, sound goes in the ear. There's this uh, coiled set of chambers and membranes that waves propagate through. <clears throat> the cochlea, you can represent uh, things like the sketch on the left there, which it shows cochlear streamlines at an instant in time, and that whole pattern propagates down the spiral. <clears throat> you can straighten that out and make a box model, as in the upper right there. This is from a paper by Zweig, Leips, and Pierce in 75 or 76, somewhere back there, which was very influential on me because they introduced, uh, or explained, I should say, they weren't necessarily the first ones to do it, but explained how the uh, the WKB method from quantum physics could be used to come up with solutions to how waves propagate in this kind of uh, non-uniform medium. And I looked at the mathematical structure of what that approximation was about and saw that it could be factored into uh, what I call a cascade. That is, <clears throat> each, little, each little segment of the cochlea acts like a, a local filter on a propagating wave, and when you put you put a cascade of these filters together, you have a very good model of what the wave propagation looks like. So this is, uh, I think, the, the piece of the peripheral modeling approach that is most nearly unique to me. I'm not the only one that's done it, but I think I've kind of pushed this concept more than anyone else, and most auditory models don't, um, don't include this kind of uh, cascade structure that's so directly tied to a forward propagating wave. When we, um, when, we, when we take this concept and flesh it out, flesh out the details of what each of those cascaded filter stages needs to do and put the feedback that controls their parameters to make the system have overall the right compressive nonlinearities and so forth, we get this structure I call the CARFAC stands for cascade of asymmetric resonators with fast-acting compression. 
I didn't make up the acronym. That's from Roy Patterson. So if you don't like it, blame him. So, and I discovered recently, I was visiting Oxford in England and uh, they have a, a crossroads there and a tower that's called the Carfax Tower, C-A-R-F-A-X. And I'm wondering if he had that in mind when he came up with this. But uh, I didn't know that Carfax is like a 500 year old word that means a crossroads. I just kind of ran into that. Anyway, um, I, I have this model that's the, a large part of what the book is about, sort of the, the middle part three out of five of the book is about the development of this model in detail, how we go about analyzing the cochlea and applying all the system theory, linear and nonlinear system theory to come up with a model that's sort of self-consistent with a view of how things work and can be implemented as efficient computer code that runs, runs fast on ordinary hardware. So it makes not just a good model of how the cochlea works, but a good sound processor that you can use in the front end of your machine hearing system to extract meaning from sound. And we've built a bunch of things with this. If you're a double E, as many of you here are, you'll recognize pole zero diagrams here and what I'm trying to show with these uh, different positions of poles and zeros and these parameters, the, the zetas, these are the damping factors that move the poles to have that damping and move the zeros along with them. And when you do that, you get these local stage transfer functions that have a little bit of a bump or sort of pseudo resonance followed by a dip and then they level off at a few dB down. So a very simple two pole, two zero transfer functions with one uh, frequency parameter that depends on where they are in the cascade and one damping parameter that depends on the current state of the feedback. When they're low damping, they provide more gain. When they're high damping, they provide less gain. And it's this variable damping that implements the automatic gain control that leads to the overall compressive nonlinearity that lets the system have high sensitivity to weak sounds without blowing out for loud sounds. That thing gets realized as a digital approximation. It gets discretized in the discrete time domain and implemented with, uh, if you're familiar with typical uh, digital signal processing flow diagrams, uh, you'll know these blocks that are delays and multipliers and adders and stuff like that. Some people would uh, draw this differently or write it as lines of code, but in, in fact, we implement it as lines of code and it's not a very complicated structure. The, <clears throat> the biggest complication is that uh, dotted line block that hangs on the side called the DOHC. That's not a dual overhead cam, that's a digital outer hair cell. Works kind of like a dual overhead cam, you know, it sits on top and regulates things. But it's, um, it, it, takes the, it takes feedback from some smoothing filters that are looking at how much activity the cochlea is sending down the auditory nerve to the brain and it feed, feeds back to tell it how active to be, to be more active or less active. The more activity it has, the more it tells it to be less active, and that's why it behaves in a overall very compressive way to regulate the level at the output. So again, pretty simple code for this. Uh, it's got some, some wrinkles that make it a little bit more complicated, and that's all discussed in detail in the book. When you put it all together and you look at the transfer functions that you get from the input, say the signal coming through the outer and middle ear, from there to each one of these taps in the cascade, you get this family of transfer functions. In quiet, you get these uh, pretty high gains up to around 60 or so dB here. But when you have a sound present like uh, speech at a moderate level, the gain drops by 20, 30, 40 dB, depending on how loud things are. So uh, I've, I've shown it here once in quiet and once in a state where it's adapted to a speech sound. <clears throat> the overall result of that is this uh, compressive nonlinearity. Here the, uh, the dark curve with the steps and overshoots is the, um, the amplitude response in response to a, 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 uh, to um, a tone complex in this case, a set of like four tones close in frequency. And at each, uh, <clears throat> at each half second mark there, I, I up the level by 20 dB. That's a factor of 10 in amplitude. And when I do that, at very low levels, the system is linear. So you get these uh, 
20 dB of output increase per 20 dB of input increase, and at very high levels it's linear. But through the middle range, which is where basically all sounds that you hear are from, say, 20 to 80 dB SPL, it's very compressive. It's roughly a slope of one-third, which means what you might call cube root compression. So if I, <coughs> if I increase the input by 30 dB, the output would only increase by 10 dB. So it's very compressive. It keeps the output within a very limited range when the input varies over a much larger range. I've also plotted here what happens with some of the distortion products, what we call the quadratic distortion, which is a, uh, <clears throat> a low frequency difference tone that propagates through, that, that gets generated where, these, where this digital outer hair cell model is and it propagates down to the place where it resonates. And you can measure it at its place and see how big it is. And again, it shows that the system is fairly linear at very high levels and very low levels where the quadratic distortion is well below the level of the primaries and quite nonlinear in the middle region where distortion is actually uh, present. It's not huge, but it's, it's actually detectable in psychophysical experiments. It's audible and it sort of matters a little bit. So realistic nonlinearities. Uh, the cubic distortion tones do similar things. I didn't plot them here, but they behave realistically. So with this as a front end to a machine hearing system and with other kinds of more conventional front ends as well, we've, bu we've built a lot of systems for extracting meaning from sound. And I'll just play you an example here of one of those that's, that's kind of fun because it, uh, it recognizes different kinds of sounds and puts up their names on the screen. This is Sean. So you can see what's happening with these colored bars. At this point, it thinks it's detected music, musical instrument. Uh, what does that one say? I don't know. Trumpet. And trumpet. I can't read the yellow one. But anyway, brass, brass, brass instrument, trumpet. Anyway, so it's, it's, we have a bunch of overlapping sound categories. We put onto the picture the ones that show up the most in this particular cut, but there's actually like 600 others. So there's a bunch of different categories we can recognize. And this just gives you an idea what that's like. The picture at the bottom is like a spectrogram or cochleogram that's kind of a conventional view of sound. to the end. That's a chordophone, that's a stringed instrument. And there's your vacuum cleaner. All right, so everything from different musical instruments to vacuum cleaners are within the ontology of sounds that we have. And we release this big database, open source uh, sound ontology, and set of uh, basically times of clips in YouTube where you can find hundreds of examples of each category. So a lot of people in the academic community have been able to tap into that and design their own systems and compare performance and so on. <clears throat> so that's been a fun project that's led by um, Dan Ellis in our New York City branch. Anyway, um, that one's based on uh, sort of short time power spectrum, which is sort of the first order thing you can get out of a peripheral model, a cochlear model, or a filter bank, which tells you on a, you know, like every few milliseconds, how much energy you have at each different frequency band. <clears throat> but if you look at what's actually coming out of the cochlea in those different uh, frequency channels, out of that cascade filter bank, as detected by the inner hair cells in the cochlea, there's actually a lot of activity that's synchronized to the fine temporal structure of the waveform. So here, for example, is a uh, set of data from Bertrand Delgut at uh, the Peabody lab at Harvard. And it uh, basically shows, this is from a cat auditory nerve where 
each line of these, he's managed to get a microelectrode into a different nerve fiber in the auditory nerve and record the pattern of response to a certain repeated speech waveform. So it's like, I don't know what the speech waveform is, but something like a steady vowel, like ah. And, and you, for each cycle of that vowel, which is a periodic signal, you can pick up the nerve spikes that occur and make a histogram of them over that cycle. It's called a peristimulus time histogram. And you get enough spikes and that histogram turns into these nice looking waveforms. And so you can see where the nerve likes to fire time-wise and you can see the patterns that essentially correspond to what the inner hair cells are, are uh, detecting as the waveform excursions. Essentially a half-wave rectified version of the waves in the cochlear basilar membrane. The interesting thing about these is that no matter what the center frequency of the neuron or the characteristic frequency of the neuron, the CF, from down there at a few hundred hertz up to three kilohertz, they all have the same period. Of course they have to have the same period. They're all being driven by a periodic stimulus. But the point is that period is prominently visible in the patterns. So at every CF in the cochlea, every place in the cochlea, the pitch of the voice sound is being encoded by a periodic pattern. Some are more obviously periodic at the pitch rate and some are more, more nearly synchronized, like in the middle frequency region here, they're more nearly synchronized to the uh, resonances of the formants of the vowel. But there's still a strong periodicity at the pitch rate as well. So if you, if you uh, well, there's the stimulus waveform at the bottom, that's the speech signal. So all this periodic structure, this fine temporal structure is being sent down the auditory nerve toward the brain. What happens with it? Where does it go? What's it good for? And, and how does it get there for that matter? How it gets there is through what we call a detection nonlinearity. For example, here the, uh, if the green is the waveform on the basilar membrane after you hit it with an impulse or you hit it with one of the pitch pulses of the speech signal, the blue is what you might get out of an uh, inner hair cell detection nonlinearity that, in this case, it's an example of a squared half-wave rectifier. So you get these nice pulses coming out. You can use different kinds of uh, rectifier nonlinearities. Some are more uh, sigmoidal and some are just like an ideal half-wave rectifier. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference. They'll all capture the same basic temporal pattern, but with subtle differences that we can try to get at through some experiments. This one called rational function is what I use in the, in the CARFAC. It's not too hard to compute and it's fairly realistic, I think. So what do you do with the, all this fine temporal structure that's coming down the auditory nerve? It's still high bandwidth. It's much faster varying. It's, it's like, you know, it's, it's patterns that are varying at audio kinds of rates, which is much faster than you can transmit, say, images to the brain. So what do you do with all this structure? It's, um, it's got repetitive structure, but it's not synchronized to any, uh, any frame, that, any like time frame that you can use to uh, analyze it on. It's just kind of repeating and temporal patterns. What do you do with it? How do you turn that into a movie or an image that you can project to the brain? <clears throat> so <clears throat> that's, the, uh, that's what I call uh, using, again, Roy Patterson's terminology, auditory images. We used to call them correlograms because we make them by correlation. But the point is you can kind of demodulate the fine temporal structure to make movies that you can send to the brain. The, one of the motivations of this, again, is the visual system where um, we, we, we ask this question. What, we have this tonotopic organization that means that each tone frequency has a place. So we have a dimension of spatial organization by frequency, but the cortex has two dimensions of sheet structure. What, what can we do with that other dimension? What, what do we encode? And the corresponding thing in vision they call retinotopy, and the retina, the back of your eye, already has two dimensions. So you just kind of directly project place in the retina to place in the visual cortex, and you've got a retinotopic projection. What can we do that's analogous to that, to turn sound into pictures that project to the cortex? So that's what auditory images are about. <clears throat> and the answer to the question was actually provided to us in 1951 by J.C.R. Licklider. 
you should all be hopeful, hopefully be familiar with his name because he's kind of the grandfather of the internet. He's, he's kind of the reason for a lot of modern technology, so look him up. But, but before he did all that cool stuff, he was an auditory physiologist, auditory psychologist, I should say. And he came up with this theory about how signals coming off the cochlea at different places, this is that cochlea structure in which waves propagate from the input at the middle ear here all the way down toward the apex. At each inner hair cell that taps off a signal out of the cochlea, he put this uh, delay line correlator structure that would, that would make an estimate of the short time autocorrelation function parameterized by the lag tau. It says, to, you know, to what extent at this time delay is this signal correlated with what it was that much earlier? And this induces this second spatial dimension. So now we have something analogous to retinotopy. We have this uh, tonotopic X dimension and this, this lag axis that provides another dimension. And when you do that, you can make pictures that have pretty interesting structure. And you can make movies of sound. So Malcolm Slaney and I did this back in the 80s and 90s, and he made this nice movie back then, which managed to still run from when he made a QuickTime movie out of it back on the Cray-1 computer at Apple. Sight is the lord of astronomy, the prince of mathematics. It counsels and corrects all the arts of mankind. What fun. Here, observe. Uh... See, the dark vertical lines follow what the muscles in my throat do. Now, I will change the shape of my mouth, but keep the same pitch with my throat. Yes. So, Sight is the let me stop that somewhere interesting. So you can see a lot of interesting structure in these movies. You can see that when there's a... Uh, it's hard to find a good frame in here. What is that? When there's a steady sound, like when he's saying a vowel, like, ah, oh, you get this steady picture. Steady sound, steady picture. That's what we mean by a stabilized auditory image. And the, the sound is steady in the sense that it, it sounds steady to you. It's not like the waveform's not doing anything. The waveform's doing a lot. But it's doing it in a, in a repetitive way, like a complex tone and the nature of that tone is represented in this picture. In this case, the interval between these vertical bars corresponds to the time lag equal to one pitch period. So the periodicity shows up in the spacing of these vertical structures. The shape of his throat, as he said, the formant frequencies that determine what vowel is being spoken determine sort of dark bands, which are the the resonances of the vocal tract, because that vertical axis here is the frequency or the cochlear place dimension. So you get the cochlear place on the vertical axis, you've got the correlation lag on the horizontal axis, and now you've got a stabilized auditory image. It's got all kinds of great properties in terms of representing uh, kind of short time sound properties, not just spectrum, not just periodicity, but a, a really interesting unified combination of those. And it has the property that when you have sound mixtures, you very often see the most prominent features of each sound in a mixture still coming through in the right place. Much more so than you would see that in a spectrum or a spectrogram. So it gives you another dimension in which signals can separate. We do a lot of things with it. Here's just examples of some frames and <clears throat> on the bottom, what I'm showing here is the average of all the rows in that picture makes what we call a summary correlogram, which just has the lag dimension. There's no more frequency axis in this bottom summary picture. So we've, instead of the conventional view of sound as being a function of frequency, here we have it as a function of time delay. It's just like an autocorrelation, only it's, uh, it's, it's a kind of a non-negative thing. So it's very good for identifying the periods and the pitches of sounds. We can put these kinds of things together in various ways and make uh, different kinds of representations and play cool sounds through them and see how they behave. Let me just play a little snippet of music here.
Well, I come from Alabama with my banjo on my knee. Yeah, so you probably uh, can tell by looking at the picture that that's James Taylor singing, right? No, you probably can't tell anything by looking at the <laughs> pictures yet because it would take many hours of studying these things to, to learn what to do with them. But that's, that's one of the things we're actually trying to do is to see, well, this picture in the middle, the one I call the stabilized auditory image, is the one I, I think has the most potential. We want to see if people can learn to read these. So who would be motivated to spend a lot of hours looking at these things and trying to read them? And that's someone who's deaf. So I have a deaf guy on my team now, and he's actually spent a lot of time looking at these things. He finds them fascinating. And I can't say he can read speech from them, but he feels like he might be able to get to that if he works on it. So that's one interesting thing. But to use these as input to a machine learning system, uh, the machine learning systems have more patience than people. So that, that still seems like a good idea. <clears throat> so these. These are the two first layers of my four-layer machine hearing architecture. The, the CARFAC as a peripheral model, the stabilized auditory image as a way to produce these two-dimensional movie-like things to feed into the higher levels that are structured like machine vision models. These are good models of what goes on in the cochlea. We can argue about how good, and John and I do have that argument, ongoing frequently. Um, but there's some good things about these models, and there's some things that may or may not be right. But within this structure, you can always replace the models to try something better and see if you come up with things that work better. The code for all this stuff is open sourced on GitHub. Just search for Carfac. We've got Python, we've got MATLAB, C++. And they're documented in great detail in the book. So it's not a bad substrate for building systems on. Here's some more uh, examples. This one is a bird. So there's, there's a bunch of things going on here. And this, this middle picture is the SAI. And the, the, uh, the sound here is not steady. It's got these things coming and going really fast. So the picture comes and goes pretty fast, too. And it's, we've got this uh, logarithmic lag axis going into the long lags on the left so that you can see correlation patterns on the right that correspond to the pitch and on the left that correspond to the rhythm and repetitions and syncopations and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, that's enough of that one. Again, I can't really take the time to explain exactly how to read these things right now. You'll probably know what this one is. This one I, I found interesting because on this on the this stabilized auditory image here, the the axis that actually has zero lag at this point and gets uh, exponentially longer as you go to the left, it has this this region on the left which you, you usually see kind of rhythm, time scale, repetitions like syllables and and the <clears throat> the repetitions of the ringing bell and stuff like that is what we're seeing over here. That's why you see some regularity. And in the short time, you see the frequencies that are present in that ring. But in this, this kind of middle region, you don't normally see much in speech and music going on in that region because it's, it's sort of uh, 8 to 32, an eighth to a 32nd of a second kind of repetition. That's a region that corresponds to what we call roughness makes things sound pretty awful. You don't normally have those repetition periods in speech and music. But if you want to make an alarm sound, that's what you want. So there they are. Somebody did a paper about uh, baby screams having modulations in that region. I said, yeah, I know that. So Here's another way I like to experiment with displays of some of these things. So what I've done here is uh, the top part is a scrolling cochleogram, just uh, activity versus frequency and time. The bottom part is a summary SAI turned with the lag axis running vertical, and that's what I call a pitchogram. 
So you can see as the, as the vocals come in, the, uh, the shapes of these tracks correspond to the pitches of the notes that are being sung. You can see those pitches very clearly in the, in the time lag dimension, much less clearly in the frequency domain where the energy is more associated with formants. So by having these two representations together, both scrolling in time, you get kind of different complementary view of that, of that sound waveform. So this is not a stabilized image. This doesn't give you like a, a steady picture for a steady tone. It's always scrolling. But for more dynamic things like trying to read speech and music, it might be fun. The stabilized auditory image is actually over here on the right, and I've put it in both directions because in one case is I'm scrolling the row averages, in the other direction I'm scrolling the, uh, the column averages. So, and then I've got kind of a going around a corner with perspective here just so I can see more time lag into the past. So I have fun with this kind of stuff, just playing with MATLAB code to make frames and putting animations together. <clears throat> Let's see, I got some speech and tones here. Welcome to the world of Java Sound. With the new Java Sound API, you can control audio Start, playback or record new audio Where's content. The this file was created using Java Sound. Yeah, anyway, I plan to take over the world. Uh, that's the brain speaking. Um, pinky and the brain, you guys probably know this. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> this is another one where I've, I've shown just a cochleogram on top and the, again, what I called a pictogram on the bottom, not scrolling here. This is just a way you can make a steady picture that you can put on a page or put it in a figure in a book. And it shows, in this case, the speech of the, I plan to take over the world. And you can see the, very clearly the pitch track on the bottom. Very, very easy to see where the voicing is and what the pitch is doing. On the top, very easy to see what the formants are doing. And between these, you can, you can kind of read what's being said if you know about spectrogram reading. The exact same rep representation applied to uh, piano music here with various chords being played. It's very hard to see from the spectrogram or cochleogram on top, what's going on in terms of notes and the pitches of the notes and the harmonies, the, the chords. But in the bottom, it's much easier to see that the, the prominent time intervals in the waveforms that align between different notes. For, for example, here you can see different notes of different pitches being played, but they have here at 10 milliseconds, they all have something in common. That ties them together as part of a chord progression. <coughs> And then that switches to having uh, eight milliseconds in common across here. This is from what, uh, I don't know, I think that was Alton John, Tiny Dancer, something like that. Anyway, we use these kinds of representations in a bunch of different ways. We started off many years ago doing uh, uh, audio document search. The idea being uh, if we type a text query, we want to bring back sounds that are relevant to that query. So if I type fast car, I want to find sounds that either sound fast or sound like cars or something. So we, we <coughs> use a machine learning system to train up all the associations between the sound features that we extract from stabilized auditory images and the words. This was not a, a deep net kind of thing. In fact, it was a very shallow net. It was a single, <coughs> a single linear layer mapping. But that was uh, back in 2007, I think, that was, uh, that was pretty novel uh, demonstration of the power of using uh, auditory models to access large sound databases and with a little bit of simple machine learning. We've got um, more kind of commercial monetizable applications that we worked on things like copyrighted recording detection. In particular, the cover song identification is one that, that I built using, um, using stabilized auditory images and summary, stable, summary autocorrelograms, you could say, to, um, to basically get a representation in which the pitch, a uh, pitch sequence of a musical piece is easily identified and then converting that to a um, a key independent or transposition independent, uh, what we call musical interval gram, 
that represented the sequences of musical intervals in a piece, and we used some uh, locality-sensitive hash functions on those to do matching in large databases. So you might have uh, millions of songs in a database, and if somebody uploads a new video with a, you know, playing something on their guitar like Stairway to Heaven or something, you want to know what that is, you, uh, you query the database with this uh, kind of hash table based locality sensitive hashing and figure out what's close to it, verify the match. And you can find out who, if anybody owns the uh, copyright to the underlying compositions, the underlying uh, melodies. And, the thing about the uh, online video business is that it's all about selling ads and you can't sell ads unless you know who the copyright owner is and, and so a new way to identify a new copyright owner was a, was a new way to sell ads. So this was good. This, this made some money and earned us our keep so they, then we got to work on other fun things. So some of these other applications like the, the YouTube song eraser, this is a feature some of you may have seen. Um, it's not really based on the same uh, concepts. It's not really based on um, an auditory model. It's more based on uh, conventional adaptive filter signal processing. But the idea there is if, if we've uh, detected copyrighted music in your video and we've got ads on there and you'd rather not have ads on there, we'd say, okay, well, we'll take the music out for you. So we can, we can cancel the music because we have a reference track for it and we can do an adaptive filter that cancels it and leave your other foreground audio in there. So if you're, if you're talking and the music's playing behind you, we can take that music out if you want. And then you no longer have copyright claim against your video, you no longer have ads on it. So this was kind of cool. Um, it's all about user value. We did a bunch of work on music recommendation, sound event detection I showed you, various kinds of classifiers and recommenders for videos. Uh, speech recognition, <clears throat> worked on the, uh, the front end to the OK Google detector for Google Home and Android phones and things like that to make them more, more auditory-like. That helped a lot. We've got bioacoustics projects working on uh, with groups, with outside groups with databases of bird sounds, whale sounds, dolphins, fish, and so on. The, the whale work, humpback whale detection, has been in the news recently. It's getting a lot of good press. Take a look at that. On the melody matching, we did a rather, I, I sort of mentioned this elaborate uh, interval gram feature detection thing we did. This is like an example of what goes in the layer three of the, of the layer cake representation of uh, system architecture, which is to, to extract features that are kind of tuned to the application. So since we, since we knew what we were trying to match was a melody, the, the concept is a cover song, which means somebody else did a song that somebody else has already recorded. We figured the way to do the matching is with melody. Given that, we figured the pitches are what matter and the transposition doesn't, so it's the pitch interval shifts that matter and so on. So we, we applied all this logic to coming up with this feature that made this picture in the lower right here. And that picture encodes uh, a lot of stuff about a melody that you can then do matching on with locality sensitive hashing. We're working on spatial applications as well, things where you have multiple microphones and you want to know where the sounds are, you want to enhance things from different directions, like if you're sitting around a table trying to, <clears throat> well, if you are a table like a smart speaker and you've got people speaking around you, you want to know who's, who's saying what. You want to know if the same person who said, okay, Google asked you a question, for example. Uh, direction can help with that. Improved uh, voice communications with speaker phones and mobile devices. Aids for people that are deaf and hard of hearing. Again, with our uh, deaf colleague, he, he likes to experiment with microphone arrays up on the lunch table and things like that. Uh, security systems. If you've got like a smart camera, security camera in your home and it, uh, it can tell you what it sees, but if it could also tell you what it hears, and what direction it is, that could be useful. Like if it says, I heard glass breaking and I can't see it, but it's over there. That's, that's maybe different from knowing it's over there. So directional things are relevant to that space. Um, things like creating a diary of who said what during a meeting. Again, space is a big part of that. 
music understanding in the real world where you've got, say, orchestras sitting around with different people in different places, the spatial cues can be very helpful there. Things like robot orientation. If you talk to your robot, it should face you and reply if it knows which way to face. Things like that. So localization with two ears relies on the time difference of arrival of signals. This was very apparent to engineers back during the First World War, even when they built these elaborate devices to exaggerate the time difference cues. With this device, you could, you, you've got two sets of pickups, one spaced horizontally and one spaced vertically, and they both have these tubes that go in your ears. And you just, you rotate the device until the sound you're listening to, like the airplane or whatever, if it sounds like it's right in front of you, that means you've got the same time delay in both ears, which means that your, your, your pickup tubes are normal to the direction of the incoming wave. So you can get very fine spatial resolution with a divine device like this. And these were made during a time when the auditory community had not yet accepted the concept of interaural time difference cues. So the people studying hearing didn't know how this could work, but the people studying sound knew it worked and they just did it. So that was kind of a, to me, a very interesting part of the, the whole history of the development of concepts in binaural hearing is that people were doing it, <clears throat> utilizing these cues before the auditory scientists would admit that such a thing was possible. Um, there's some very important facts about sound and about acoustics and auditory processing that are, that are important here. <clears throat> In the acoustic domain, that's all about how sound propagates. The important fact there is that the, the sounds tend to emit uh, sources tend to emit sounds in, in little bursts or particles or events. There's, um, like if you're in a cafe, the prominent noise besides people talking is often the little clinks and taps of silverware and dishes. You get these real outlier events that, that just propagate. And the direct path arrives first. So before you get the complicated reverberant effect of the space you're in, you get these little clicks arriving directly uncontaminated by echoes. And then after that, you get all the confusion. There's a corresponding thing in the auditory system that takes advantage of those acoustic effects. It's called the precedence effect. And it, it basically says, if you want to know where a sound is coming from, pay attention to the first arrival, because everything that comes after that is an echo. So in the auditory system, there's a very strong emphasis on early arrivals or uh, leading edges of sounds in, term, in determining the apparent direction. And we know where the cells are that do this too. The bushy cells in the cochlear nucleus, they fire very precisely at outlier events. So all these little silverware clinks and so on make themselves known as having a direction because the bushy cells are very good at picking out that kind of thing. If you look in the engineering literature for how beamforming works, and direction finding algorithms and stuff like that, they typically ignore both of these facts, which is kind of weird. All the standard estimation theory stuff based on uh, Gaussian distributed signals and Gaussian noises and so on has no way to accommodate these kinds of concepts. So they, they derive algorithms based on uh, correlations and, and they prove that their algorithms are optimal but they're optimal for a signal model that is, that is completely ignorant of what's going on in the real world. So there's, a, I think, a really interesting space of things to be done here to take advantage of real signals in, in the real world as opposed to Gaussian signals in the, in the mathematical world. Here's a little diagram of some of the cool things going on in the, in the brainstem where the signals from the two cochleas get together and get compared for their amplitudes and relative timing. It's, it took me a long time to decipher the various partial diagrams of how this stuff goes together and I was quite confused because it seemed like sounds from the left were primarily uh, processed and detected in the left side lateral superior olive but they were detected in the right side medial superior olive and then I finally figured out then the, there's this crossover so that they actually get back together again. 
So the system basically works contralaterally like a lot of our senses where sounds on the left get projected up to the right side of the brain and vice versa. But um, trying to understand what all these pieces do in detail is, uh, is still somewhat beyond us, I think. But we do have a lot of good data on what some of the little pieces do, like in the ventral cochlear nucleus here, the spherical bushy cells and globular bushy cells are the ones that fire with exquisite timing to outlier events. And these can be used for, for comparing the signals between the two ears. There are other cell types in there, like the octopus cell that's typically characterized as having an onset type post-stimulus histogram, I think is more involved in the, <clears throat> the monaural stabilized auditory image for pitch type correlations. But again, that's kind of speculation at this point. I've done a little bit of work on trying to emulate the bushy cells for some of these applications, and I'm going to just skip through a bunch of this stuff because I don't have any more time. But the point is with, um, with sparse events that are detected by these kind of bushy cell models at, at just outlier events, you can still make these um, pictures that are like uh, uh, pictograms and so forth that are as good as or better than the ones you can make with the full dense signals. What I'm showing in this particular picture on the top is that uh, pitch track of that sentence again, I plan to take over the world. And then on the bottom, I have that one with another speech sound added to it. And the interesting thing is that in many cases, even when both voices are vocalizing at the same time, you can see their overlapping pitch tracks almost completely not interfering with each other because there's certain, certain frequency ranges where one has an outlier event. It doesn't matter that the other one also has some energy in that, in that channel. They manage to encode both events. So that's kind of a fun thing I've been working on. All right, I'm going to wrap up shortly here. The um, summary here, the nonlinear filter bank, the cascade structured filter bank like in the, cas in the CARFAC is a good model of the cochlea. It's got plenty of room to incorporate all the things we disagree about, I think, but it's, right now it represents the way I think it all works. It's got the longer time compressive automatic gain co control as well as, the, as, as, well as the very short time uh, uh, sparsification nonlinearities, which are expansive in the uh, bushy cells. That's, that's not in the CARFAC right now, but it's one of the things I do with it. It's good for all these uh, pitch and time difference kind of things. Works well with complex mixtures. We can simplify this greatly with what I call a linear cascade filter bank. One of, uh, one of my friends in Australia dubbed it a car light and made uh, FPGA code and TensorFlow code and things like that to implement it. Uh, it allows, uh, allows you to get at a lot of these things much more cheaply than with the uh, kind of AGC feedback thing that the full CARFAC has. And these machine methods, uh, they can successfully emulate biology. And one of the <clears throat> One of the things I want to do with these models is continue to run the same kinds of experiments on them that people run on humans and animals and see if they do the same things and where they don't, we can use that to learn something about how to make better models. So if you want to test your understanding of hearing, try to make a machine here and extract meaning. We can capture the essence of hearing's functional goals, which I think are uh, compression of a wide dynamic range and extraction of temporal structure. Spectrum is not the answer. <clears throat> Most sound processing projects start with spectrum, start with an FFT. Uh, yeah, it's not the, that's not the answer. Machine experiments are a lot easier than animal experiments, and they're, they're often more objective than uh, psychophysics and physiology anyway, because the machine can't lie. So bottom line, buy the book or don't like carrying around three and a half pounds, go to machinehearing.org and get the lightweight, complete PDF. Thank you. Yeah. So Richard, uh, so intuitively, if I try to separate the lyrics from the recorded sound, uh, good, use a mic. So, uh, 
if uh, I was trying to intuitively understand the 2D images, so if I were going to try to extract the lyrics from a recorded sound, you know, the, from the instrument background and so on, how would I uh, process that image to get to the lyrics? Yeah. Yeah, how would you process the image to separate lyrics from the other recorded musical sounds? Uh, I think the, the generalized but maybe not too satisfying answer is you, you use a machine learning system to learn the difference between what, what speech looks like and what music looks like. Um, we find that works pretty well. Um, in order for me to try to teach you manually what makes the picture look like speech and what makes it look like music, I could, I could do that to some extent, but it wouldn't be as good as what the machine would learn with a lot of data. Yeah, very interesting talk, yeah. So, it uh, seems to me, of course, these days, uh, you know, deep neural network, machine learning is really dominating, uh, kind of, uh, right, trying to revolutionize the future industry, right, a different kind of IoT segment. Uh, so, uh, people are saying for, for image processing or classification, a lot of cases, uh, they beat human, right? So, for example, for facial recognition, they can reach 99%. Right, human is probably 97%. Mm. So, so when would, uh, for example, speech recognition or music melody classification mm. reach that kind of accuracy and what are the main barriers? Yeah, um, yes, what does it take to get superhuman performance on auditory or sound tasks? <clears throat> uh, some tasks have shown, uh, or some solutions to tasks have shown superhuman performance already. There was a famous um, speech recognition challenge, I think back around 2006, of recognizing words from several people speaking at once. And if you, if you trained the system for the voices of the people that were speaking, you could get superhuman performance on that. And so I think, in general, the answer is if you have a good representation of the sound and you have a powerful machine learning system and you have a training data set and a testing data set that are well enough defined on a task that um, is learnable, you'll beat humans. But if you're if your task is more nebulous, like um, really trying to understand conversational speech, where you, you never really have enough uh, training data or a good enough understanding of even what it means to understand speech, you probably can't train the system to beat humans at things where humans are using everything they know to help in that task. Um, all the context in speech that humans know from their, from their years of understanding situations and people and so on, very hard to um, map that into the kinds of training patterns that you could put a machine learning system on. I, I mean, we try. We, we have huge deep networks that include knowledge of everything we can about language models and um, you know, uh, audit, acoustic models of phonemic pronunciation and so on, and they're pretty good. But I think they're far from superhuman because the, the task there is just deeper than you can really construct a good training set for. On the other hand, if, you're, if your test set is as constrained as your training set, then it may look like you're getting superhuman performance because you've narrowed the task to where the extra information that humans have doesn't help them. So I know the answer is complicated. I don't have any simpler way to look at it, just to say that um, achieving superhuman performance on machine learning tasks is not 
that unusual or that hard. It just depends on how you define the task. There's plenty of work to do. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Anybody else? <clears throat> well, thanks for coming, first of all. Yeah. Um, quick question on, your, on the representations you've shown. Um, a lot of us care to uh, process audio and then reconstruct it, which means we want to have invertible transforms. Um, is there any light in the tunnel by using these representations to get back to the time domain if we modify them? Using these representations to get back to time domain waveforms? Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've done a lot of work on that. Malcolm and I did many years ago uh, sound resynthesis from cochleograms and corellograms. And, and as you're well aware, there's more conventional representations like the short time Fourier things with mask modifications can be reasonably well resynthesized. I think there's, a, there's probably a sweet spot in between where the representations are tuned to be a little easier to reconstruct, but more auditory and more realistic than the Fourier methods. I'm not exactly sure what that looks like. It's probably uh, something in the wavelet space, but um, yeah, help us figure that out. Thanks. Maybe one more question, if there is any. I just wonder if you've tried to um, take uh, an audio uh, music signal and, and convert that into music notation. Um, a lot of people have done that. Um, trying to think if some of my colleagues at Google have done that recently. Um, can't think of any right off. In other off, words, but music transcription. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a big problem, um, and it's a very useful problem. It is a big problem. I've talked to a lot of people that have worked on that, and I'm trying to think who's sort of most relevant recently. Um, I knew a lot more people working on that uh, back in the 90s than I do now, I think. But uh, I think we should, we should take that on again with, uh, with these techniques. And I, I had some proposals for how to do that, but I haven't got someone to, to build it yet. Um, There's a website where they say, uh, we'll, we'll transcribe anything that you send us um, using people to actually do the because they yeah. say there's no technical way to do it. Yeah, so um, musicians are pretty good at this. And <clears throat> my friend Lloyd Watts was, uh, who got into auditory stuff in a big way, was partly motivated by his own ability to transcribe piano music and thinking that it shouldn't be that hard to make a machine do that. And he discovered over the years how hard it was. But he's, he's made a good, uh, he's, he's one of the guys that's done a pretty good job of it. I don't know how general his stuff is. Maybe it's not every musical instrument, but he was doing a pretty good job of transcribing piano music. <clears throat> yep. Okay, well, let's thank Vic.